me see. Um, how long have you been doing this for? Uh, what's your your background? How you get got started, and maybe what keeps you going? Sure. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, I'm Melanie Mendez Gonzalez, and I am the founder of Can Means What, which is a lifestyle blog for education and entertainment, Mi Cultura y Familia. And I started that blog in two, at the end of 2010. Um, let's see. So I did it when I was in the middle of a career transition, actually. I had, was in After college, I went into retail management and enjoyed um, that part of my career very much, but then wanted to leave to start a family. And so I looked at switching careers at that point and went into direct sales. Did that for a few years, um, also enjoyed it, but hit like just a plateau at some point and was really feeling like it just wasn't where I wanted to be anymore. So working with the coach at that point, She said, oh, well, you should start a blog because you have all of this background in um, management and leadership. And that, so I, I did it because she was my business coach and she always gave me sound advice. But when I started writing, it wasn't so much about what my career had been. It was more about my identity um, as a Mexican-American growing up in Texas and what that Mind you, this was in 2010, so there weren't a lot of Latina, uh, American Latina focused blogs and platforms and things like that. So I was really searching for for that identity. So that's what came out of my writing. Um, I connected with people online, um, particularly on Twitter, and found a community of other uh, Latinos who were talking about a lot of the same things that I was wanting to talk about or felt was it represented anywhere. Uh, and that's when I started going to conferences through, through that community. I found a way to go to, to conferences. And that's where I learned that people were actually making money blogging, <laughs> which for a while I had just been doing out of uh, as an outlet. So fast forward to 2020, um, 10 years later, and I have, really self-taught all the way through on um, building my WordPress site, learning social media, learning digital marketing, working with influencers, being an influencer, um, and all of those things has just added up to where I am today. Awesome. And I think, I mean, that's, um, as you were mentioning how you started with the writing, I think back maybe mm -hmm. in 2010, it was writing, like you were a blogger yeah. and you were like, In your page, and you will write your piece, and yeah, that it was, was it. Yeah, it was literally words, <laughs> like no photos, nothing else, just words yeah. and hit publish. So how how has that changed? Did you? I think you were like maybe in the, like you experienced that transition. Mm -hmm. So how did you adapt yourself? Was it hard? Maybe um, was it like? Do you think now it's better? I think also like first answering like that transition, and maybe uh -huh. also how do you still influence or how are you still relevant to a bigger audience because maybe you started with with a very niche uh audience but now you've mm -hmm. grown to maybe it's not only latinos that are like looking at you it's probably all san antonios that feel like they have a uh, latino in them or for so sure. how do you how do you keep that influence from the blog from the transition to like social media and now to like bigger audiences So I'll start with the whole going from words to everything else in media, right? So now um, I actually create content less on my actual website. And that's just because the industry changed. And especially when Instagram came out, it was more about creating content on that platform or YouTube videos or a Facebook when Facebook videos came out. So in terms of like just trying to keep up, it's just a lot of studying and watching, uh, keep, keeping my finger on the pulse, so to speak, of what the industry trends are and then going in that direction and learning as much as I can um, and how to do it and then just executing like I kind of cringe when I look back at some of my first Instagram posts or things like that <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing but the only way to find out 
how to do it was to just do it. And I will say on the flip side of that, pushing myself to um, stay on trend with the industry is what helped expand me to a larger audience. And I feel very fortunate in the sense of, you know, when I started, it was like, well, I don't see a lot of people like me on these platforms. And within the last decade, quote unquote, Hispanic marketing has just boomed to the point where it's um, not even really termed Hispanic marketing as much anymore, but more cult- uh, multicultural marketing. And even beyond that, just now everyone's in mainstream marketing or general market. Um, and so I think what's helped is that I have, even though it's been a roller coaster, um, I have stayed, I've kept my focus on who I'm trying to target, which is Latino families. And like you mentioned, the, but the audience has expanded beyond that. So while I'm creating content for Latinos, for Latino families today, Latino families aren't the only people interested in content for Latino families. Because of the growth of Latinos in America, people are trying to understand who we are, um, what we like, what are the stories. And so I feel very fortunate to have a little bit of voice in, in, in that arena. And because at the end of the day, Latino stories are American stories. And so things that are important to us are important to everyone, right? Family, education, our well-being, mental health, helping others, community service, social good. Those are things that are important to everyone. It's just my content is through the lens of a Latina mom. Thank you. And talking about that um, kind of demographic that you started with and would like to keep growing, right? Like Latino families and Latino values in the American society and all that. What does your audience look like right now? Like what is when you, I don't know if you go into your analytics of Instagram and everything, what does that look like? And how do you use that data um, to keep growing or how do you influence your post or what you're doing out there with the data you're collecting? For sure. I'm I'm trying to pull up. I actually have it on like my media kit as to who I'm actually reaching Um, because as, uh, someone who is work as an influencer. We'll use that term. I don't love that term, but I. That's why everybody understands what we do, and so that's a very important piece to know um, who is your audience and very specifically. And we have a lot of great tools like Google Analytics, um, the analytics on all of the social platforms, um, to tell us who is engaging with our content. And so mine are mostly educated female owners who are interested in news and entertainment and travel. Um, Over half of them live in Texas and California with the next big groups coming from New York and Florida. And most of my, uh, I call them my queridos, are active on mobile devices and they're between the ages of 18 and 44. That's like my largest group of, of people who engage with my content. And so that is fortunately for me, a very sought after audience. The women have um, shown to be the decision makers in the household. Um, they may or may not be making the most money in the house, but they are definitely the ones who are deciding on what is going to be purchased and brought inside the house and what activities and what organizations the family is going to be involved in. And so when I'm talking to partners, um, and by that I mean like brands or organizations that want to partner with me to create content, that's what I let them know exactly who I'm talking to. um, And if that works for, if that's the audience they're trying to reach, then we're a good match. Awesome. And um, so you mentioned when you're talking to partners, how did you, you mentioned that at the beginning, you were just 
writing and you notice that people actually get paid doing this or make money out of this. So right now, is this your full time like job? Um, Were you like at the beginning, did you have like two gigs or if not, how are you handling both? And also, how do you like, how are you managing that? Like how you started making money out of it? Or how do you start it with the partnerships and creating the right content for your audience? For sure. Uh, when I started, I was, I mentioned before, I was making zero money. I didn't even know that this was a way to uh, make money. And so I don't, actually, I would, so I would tell you one of the first organizations that I partnered with, the companies that I partnered with was right here from San Antonio, the Dr. Smith's diaper, diaper cream. They were working with the um, DeBerry group. And the DeBerry group reached out to me and said they were interested in partnering. And I'm very happy that they were one of my first major partners because the way that they handled it set the bar for me in terms of like knowing who I wanted a partner with and how I wanted that partnership to go. So they were very professional. They were very clear in their communication. And so that's, I use that as my standard. So this is obviously when my kids were babies and I, or at least one of them was still in diapers and I tried out their product and I was happy with it. So then I was able to create content around it and um, go to conferences with Dr. Smith. And we were even in a commercial with Dr. Smith and uh, went to different events. I went to Dallas a couple of times. I went to Los Angeles once with them and it was all on behalf of their brand. So I have to say working with them was a very um, learning experience, was the best learning experience as an influencer um, to know what to expect or what is possible when you're working with an organization. And so I let them lead the way a lot in that aspect. And then I would get other offers And I was able to look at him and go, okay, this is not anything like my experience with Dr. Smith. And then I was able to leverage my experience and say, well, I would like this and this and this. And I would like to, you know, get paid this amount of money based off of my experience that I had learned with Dr. Smith. Um, There was a time when I just was trying to grow really fast. And so I was just saying yes to almost everything because I saw other people around me growing really fast and they were working with all different kinds of brands and organizations. And I, you know, got the comparison bug and I wanted to do what they were doing or, um, or, or stay relevant, right? Like stay um, on par with what everyone else is doing. And I also learned a lot of, I also learned a lot of lessons that way too, in terms of like, who I don't want to work with, um, what my standard of communication is, and as well as when it was going off brand for me. Um, so like there was a, there was a time and there still is the Latina beauty blogger is such a powerful, um, brand and organ, you know, a person, a platform to be a Latina blogger today or Latina, Latina beauty blogger, Latina beauty influencer is such a powerful platform right now because all Latinas love makeup. We love to take care of our skin and, um, and then going on trend with the Hispanic marketing. Right. So I dabbled in that and I realized that it was not for me. (laughs) It was not what I should have been focusing on. Um, and so I began to learn, okay, my focuses are education and entertainment and, uh, culture and family life. And so then that gave me a way to say, to be able to say, these are the organizations I want to work with. And these organizations need to meet the same, visions that I have for Gam Means What. Because I have a mission statement for Gam Means What. I have a vision statement for Gam Means What. So now I can say, okay, this is my mission statement. This is my vision statement. 
And then I ask the brands for what theirs is or what is it for that campaign and see if we align. And then I can go based off of that. And how long did it take you to, to kind of nail that down to be like, okay, I don't need to be doing beauty vlogs and yeah. maybe like fitness. Like I need to focus on what I, I'm doing and this is what I'm doing. Like, like, what do you think? How long did it take oh, you? That, I mean, it was probably a good five years. Uh, okay. Before I, because you know, the first year was just for the first year I started blogging. I didn't even tell people what I was doing, um, and so the first I'd say two or three years I was really trying to find my footing and even what this was, and I was self-taught. So I was spending a lot of time learning, like the back end of the website and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I would say probably by my fifth year I had a, a, a good. Um, foundation of what my brand would be mm -hmm. and how hard is that learning curve of like you're not knowing and like maybe you're a writer and you're going into this or maybe you're good at I don't know like talking to the camera or talking yeah. to your customers and now you're going to manage um, social media and everything like that learning curve or maybe what's the biggest um, challenge for you in this like new technology new things being rolled out all yeah. day every day Well, that is the biggest challenge is keeping up with everything that's being rolled out on a regular basis. I mean, and my personality is just like I, uh, you would think that after being in this industry for this long and making all the adjustments that I would love change, but I actually don't. I resist almost every new platform in the beginning because it's like, oh my God, another thing I have to learn, another thing I have to um you know, uh, engage and create a community around. And so that is really the biggest challenge is like right now, uh, TikTok, right? Like that's a whole thing right now. And a lot of influencers are flocking to TikTok. It's been around for a while and it's, it has its own audience who don't even have blogs. Um, but now that it's gaining a lot of traction, a lot of people are going that way. And so that's where I'm at today. It's like, okay, what's my TikTok strategy? Do I even need a TikTok strategy? Uh, what is that going to look like? And it was the same way when Instagram came out. It was the same way when Instagram stories came out, when Facebook video came out. Is mm -hmm. thinking about what, you know, how am I going to use this? Uh, and in terms of like uh, figuring it out, it's, There's, there's one of two ways that I tell people you can do. You can pay somebody to teach you or to do it for you, or you can take the time to learn it for yourself and trial and error. So you just have to pick which, which, which one do way. you prefer. Exactly. Or which one can you afford right now, right? There's been times yeah. I can afford to have someone do it. And then there's been times when like, I, I have more money than I have. I mean, I have more time than I have money. Yeah. Okay. And then what, like you mentioned, there's been a lot of platforms like Vine and other platforms that came out. Have you ever like stayed away from a platform? Like, Hey, I'm not going to do Twitter anymore. I'm going to focus on Facebook or I'm going to like, have like, when do you know when to jump in? Uh, yeah. Or have you like jumped in something and be like, Hey, no, I'm not, I don't have time for this or this is not my audience. For sure. I uh, never got on, I never uh, did Snapchat. I mean, I did it, but I, uh, I tried to play around in it. I tried to make it a thing and it just didn't happen. And once Instagram stories really took off, I pretty much abandoned Snapchat. I just, it wasn't intuitive for me to use. Okay, perfect. And then how do you bring in your audience? Like, Or is it a completely different audience? Like what you have on Facebook and then what you have on Instagram? How do you merge them? How do you let them know about each other? Like you want them to probably yeah. um, communicate and know about each other or I don't know. How do you, how do you sure. integrate your audiences? Yeah, so um, every platform definitely has its own type of audience. You know, like Twitter is way more newsy um, and they want things fast and uh, in short bites. Um, Instagram wants is more like they want to feel like they know you, like you're their friend, like you're sharing a lot of, you know, in, uh, in, uh, a lot of stuff that's inside your, almost inside your personal life, right? They want you to feel very personal. Um, 
And so I do have to create content in the ways that I think that they will interact with it best. Sometimes it crosses over, but sometimes it doesn't. And that is just a matter, again, a matter of looking at my own analytics as well as reading things like social media today, HubSpot, um, all those, you know, larger social media uh, websites that will, will stay on the trends for you and just kind of understand what it is. Okay. And then if like, what is, cause I mean, I'm hearing that you do Twitter, you do Instagram, you do Facebook, you're, you're on events all the time, you're doing mm -hmm. stories. So how do you manage your time? Like, can you walk us through a day, <laughs> a day in like, well, two things. Can you walk us through a day before COVID and maybe now? Like, what is uh, the difference between a day before COVID and maybe now? What does your day look like? For sure. So yeah, there's definitely been a shift. So I laughed when you said time management because I'm the worst person that I know about managing my time. And so I say that to also give people hope. Like I've never been one for like coded, uh, color coded calendars and things like that. Um, I just, I literally use the apps, uh, the note apps in my phone to try to keep myself on track because I need it to be very simple for me to see all the things that I have to do and just be able to check them off. So um, a normal day. So one, I homeschool my kids. So that is my priority always. And so that, so I plan my day with what they have to do, where we have, not well, before COVID, where we had to go um, and what their lessons were, right? I have a one day a month at the beginning of the month where I plan out their entire unit lesson. And they're 10 and 13 now. So they do, a, they can do a lot on their own. So they go first and then Either I, you know, I block time for emails to respond to um, new partnerships or current partnerships. Then I look at my deadlines. Okay, what content has to go, you know, has to be submitted to the client before it's published? What content needs to get published today? And then also just the time of creating the content, right? Like, do I need to go out somewhere to take a photo or to make a video? Or do I need to go interview someone? And just kind of looking. And so every day, uh, looks different because sometimes I don't leave my house for three days at a time. And sometimes I have an event to cover four days a week. So I just try to, uh, so what I tell people is use what works for you. There's some people who can't go without their planner and can't go without all their notifications. That drives me bonkers. So I just use an, a, a list and I look at it every day, every morning. So that was before COVID-19. Since all of the, honestly, for me, the biggest change was on March 13th because that was, so I was already, I go to South by Southwest every year. I've been going for six years. I've spoken there. I volunteered there. And it's a big event for me personally to um, connect with people that I have known already or to meet new people that I hope to work with in the future. So I was really down that that was canceled. I mean, it was, it was a like, I get it, but I'm really sad because I, I couldn't, I still couldn't see what was coming. And so with that being canceled, um, and that was before, that was like the, the sixth or seventh that they canceled it. And so with that being canceled, I was already thinking, okay, what can I do in San Antonio then? How can I get out and network? Because without South by, that was a huge piece of my networking for the entire year. And then on March the 13th, literally everything that I had booked canceled in one day. So it wasn't a trickle effect for me. It was like, on March 13th, I woke up at 7.30, and by 5.30 that day, everything that I had planned, partnerships I had to work with, events that I was going to cover, um, my all my speaking gigs, there's about six things in total that all just canceled, boom, 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 in one day. So 
Yeah. So it, in my response at first was, uh, well, I mean, I kind of was like in shock for a little while, like, oh, wow, this is very real. I don't know what's going to happen now. Um, and then after my days of like, well, actually, immediately I went into let me help the people who need hope, who have to homeschool their kids now. So I started creating content around that. I did a Facebook Live, I read a blog post, I did some guest um, talks with other people um, because at that point, parents had just found out they were gonna keep their kids at home for like another, another week or another 10 days. It wasn't what it is right now. So I was like, well, let me, let me use this expertise, which I don't normally talk about, but I felt that it was important and relevant to share. Let me use that to help parents um, give them some guidance, give them some encouragement, give them some resources. And then after that, it was like going back to, like I mentioned, I would look at my notes app and see what I had to do for the day. And that was when it all started hitting me. Like, there is nothing on my notes app to do. There are no deadlines. There are no speeches to prepare. So what am I going to do? And so now I have been reaching out to current and past clients. Um, most, since what I do is in really in the market, everyone's marketing budget, all the budgets have just been put on hold or just gone away right now. But I have been trying to reach out to people I've worked with to see how we can work together right now. Because as a content creator, the most important thing that I have is my audience. So if I am not creating and putting out content, then what's going to happen to my audience, right? So I think about it in terms of what's on the other side of this. I know everything as we know it will look different when we're on the other side of this, but I can only do what I can see in front of me right now. And right now that's my audience. So what am I, how am I providing value to them? What am I giving them? How am I staying engaged with them? And that's how I try to do every day now. And then, on, so that's for them, right? So I'm still, like I just did something with the um, Texas CASA, the, um, the group that helps uh, foster kids. And so, because April is child abuse awareness. And so I actually asked, we were wrapping up a campaign and then I asked them, what could I do to help? Because I knew that there was a spike in domestic abuse and child abuse cases since we went in shelter in place. And so I wanted to be able to help. So I, so I worked with them on that. There was the census that we had done with the Hispanic Chamber. So we talked about doing the census. So I was still creating some content with organizations. And I hope to continue to do that with organizations that are open to being creative as to how we can work together right now. Um, but that, so before COVID-19 was a lot of me getting emails in my inbox, after is me sending out a lot of emails to people and um, hoping to get some bites on people as, as to how we can work together creatively. Great. And so I guess like your time management, or I don't know if you want to call that since <laughs> you say you don't, <laughs> but like your, your, your task, your list of, of what you need to do every day has changed. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but maybe you have grown your audience. I mean, a lot of people are staying at home. A lot of people maybe don't have uh, or have more time to go on social media, yeah. take breaks, uh, even if they're working at home. So how has that grown? How, ha how have you taken like advantage maybe from this situation to reach a bigger audience? Not that you, you're taking advantage of For sure. the pandemic, but advantage right. of the, the internet. I mean, yeah. the social media and everything. Absolutely. It's a different opportunity, right? Like there's, uh, so I would say for me personally, it's with the homeschool stuff, because even though I talk about education on the blog, I don't uh, cover a lot of stuff about homeschool. Like I don't share the exact curriculum that we're using and the things that we do to day to day. That's not on my blog. And I do that intentionally because I want to give my kids some privacy, like they've essentially had their life online. 
since they were three. Um, and so I figured homeschool was one way I could keep, you know, that part of their life private. But with this, um, that's definitely been a new audience to talk to. Um, and a lot of people, they didn't know that I've been homeschooling since 2012. And not just homeschooling, but I've been homeschooling and working from home um, this entire, for the last eight years. And so in terms of like new people or growing my audience, that's a whole other group of people that I'm getting to meet and help, hopefully helping um, that I wasn't really talking to before. And then there's things like this week, I'll have um, more focus. So, you know, I had mentioned like before, um, organiz partners really wanted more content on Instagram and not so much the blog. But now I can go in and create the things that I want to have live on my blog. Like in particular, everybody's at home watching um, Hulu and Netflix and streaming. And so there's all of these shows with Latino characters or they were produced by Latinos or written by Latinos. And so I'm really excited to get to um, create those kinds of lists and blog posts to let everybody know like, Yes, you know, I know we're at home and we have to watch, you know, we, there's not a whole bunch to do, but we are watching a lot of TV. Why not watch all of these shows to support the Latinos who have worked so hard to get their space um, on the screen? I'm sorry. That's I was okay. trying to unmute myself. <laughs> um, and then from, I mean, you mentioned your kids, how you kind of, because of the nature of your work, they had to be involved in some sort of way. So how has mm -hmm. your family, your kids, like, engaged? Or how have they taken you being kind of a personality influencer slash blogger slash just like a public figure in, in San Antonio? Uh, has it been difficult? How have you kind of maybe had conversations on this? Or do you have any insight? Oh, for sure. So when uh, now they're used to it, right? Like now almost nothing surprises them. But in the beginning, when a lot of opportunities were coming up and we would get to go places, um, which by the way, worked really well uh, hand in hand with um, homeschooling. For example, we got to go on this tour with SAWS, the SAWS, the water system. And it was like this, um, it was from, one of their plants, right? And so we got on a bus and we went out there and we had this whole media tour and the kids got to see it all and everything. So they, it was a very a big learning experience for them. So they've gotten to see all kinds of behind the scenes, my kids in particular, behind the scenes, behind the scenes um, events and places because of what I do, which for the most part, they really enjoy. <laughs> And, but there are times where I would have to explain to them, you know, um, we're doing this because mommy writes a blog. And so while this is fun and exciting, there are also things that we have to get done. There are things that we have to do. And so, for example, like when Disney on Ice came, we, you know, got to go to the VIP suite and then they we got to have the, the tickets to the show and do all of that. And the boys understood that it was because of the blog. And once they understood that, we had to say it a couple of times for them to really get it. But once they did, then they were happy to take the photos and they were happy to contribute because they understood that it was work and not just, you know, um, we're at this place just because we want to be. Um, so for the most part, they have really enjoyed it. Um, my older son, he wants a TikTok. So we're in talks about doing that because he is an artist. And so we have talked about starting a TikTok where he's um, drawing. And so now that they're a little bit older, there's a lot of conversation around that, around them creating their own content online and what that'll look like. So that'll be a whole new thing for me to explore because even though I'm online a lot and I've used you know, them in photos and told some of their stories, I was very protective about letting them have their own social media. They don't have any social media. And so now we're moving into that space of them getting ready to do it. And um, my husband's happy 
with what I, as long as I'm happy <laughs> and he's happy and uh, he enjoys some of the benefits too of getting to go to different places and getting to meet people and um, and he's been very very supportive of all the things they've gotten to do and you know at the same time like I've been able to take my family on vacation a, a few times like three times we've gone on vacation that was due that was you know paid for because of what I do so that makes everybody happy <laughs> I bet you're the one with a cool job at your, yeah. like, I don't know what your husband does, but <laughs> yeah. you look the one as a cool parent. <laughs> and then, um, so how do you cope with um, criticism? Like, I know being a Latina in front of the camera, um, and, the, and that might not be the, like, the first thing people want to, or expect to see on social media, or even when you started, how do you cope, or like maybe comments, uh, I don't know if you get any of, of that kind of like hate mail, quote unquote, but like, how do you cope with criticism and, and maybe people that don't like what you're doing or yeah, kind of haters? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, I've been really lucky. I'll say I haven't got, I haven't received near as much what I've seen some of my colleagues um, get. So I'm very grateful for that. But that doesn't mean I haven't gotten anything. Uh, some of the comments are harsh, you know, everybody has an opinion. And if I were doing this, if I had gotten those comments, you know, when I first started, I think it would have been a very different story. I was, I mean, part of why I started writing was, you know, exploring my own identity, exploring who I was. I wasn't as confident in, in who I am today. So, but Today, I, there is a, a writer, a researcher, everyone who knows me knows that I'm obsessed with her, Brene Brown, and she has, she uses the quote from um, Theodore Roosevelt about not listening to the people who are not in the arena with you. And so the way that I interpret that for me is if there's someone who is leaving comments or tweeting at me and they don't even have like a profile picture and they're not using their real name and they're not really giving any uh, valuable feedback, I don't listen to them because they're not in it. They're, they're not in the game that I'm in. I, when I create content, I'm trying to do it for what? For either entertainment or education. And if someone, and so if, when people are responding and want to have a conversation about that, by all means, we might not always agree, but at least we're going to have a conversation about what we're doing online. And anybody who's not there to have a conversation, but just to, to throw things at you, they're in, they're in the, they're in the stands, right? Like they're in the stands of the arena. They're not on the, uh, they're not in the arena with you. So now I just kind of let it roll off my back. Um, I, I feel much more grounded in who I am and what I'm doing with this platform that I don't really, I don't really let it bother me. Okay. And then you mentioned how you kind of talked with colleagues. I don't know, like I'm unaware of what the blogger influencer uh, social media personality kind of community looks like in San Antonio. So are you, how do you feel about it? Like, is, do you go to them a lot? Uh, do they come to you? Uh, how, how do you find support in that? Or is it other networks that you also find support? I know like you're artists, so how do you create, how do you collaborate with the community? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, if you want to start with that. Sure. In terms of the the community here in San Antonio, it has grown exponentially. I mean, there's new creators, new influencers, like every day. And it's really kind of neat to see so many different people's perspective of San Antonio. So I, I think that it's awesome. When I first started every conference that I went to, even today, all the conferences that I went to were not even in Texas. 
they were in New York, in Miami, in LA. They were not. So I didn't really find a community in San Antonio until much, much later, um, partly because there were just not a lot. And also because there was just, there was no one person or group bringing everyone together until there was. And then, and that was mostly mommy bloggers. Um, but that's not the case anymore. I mean, there's so many foodies, there's lifestyle uh, bloggers, there's Instagrammers, um, there's TikTokers now. I mean, look at um, Adam Ray OK. I mean, he's blown up. On TikTok, it's so crazy. And so before, it used to be like we all knew each other. And now it feels like there are people everywhere. And I don't even know who everyone is in San Antonio. And I think that's a great thing. I think that means that people are doing what they're doing as they're doing it, right? Like not, they're not waiting for anyone's permission. They're just executing. They're creating content. And the, the more that other people grow the more that anybody grows from san antonio the better that it is for all of us because in in marketing like is the big umbrella of marketing um san antonio is still a small market which has been a a hurdle for me a lot of times people wanted texas latina bloggers but they wanted them from houston or dallas because those were bigger markets so the more that we can grow in san antonio the better that it's going to be for all of us um but most and i have a few right like everybody sees me like with puro pinche um so there's some few content uh, influencers that we you know are still we'll create content together we'll do things together and things like that but most of my colleagues are still outside of of Texas and San Antonio. Okay. And then how do you, as you collaborate, maybe everyone has different audiences or images or even messaging. How do mm -hmm. you protect your messaging? How do you make sure that somebody doesn't, even your, your audience takes a video and, and makes something out of it that's not what you want it to yeah. them to do? Or even when you collaborate, how do you curate that the other person is not gonna go the next day and do something that might affect your image? Uh, well, that hasn't happened to me yet. <laughs> um, but I will say I'm very, very particular. Again, I guess that's the answer. So I'm very, very particular about who I'm going to collaborate with. Like, I'm gonna say, uh, you and I are going to do this together and we're going to create something together. I haven't done that with very many people. I will also say in the beginning, in the early, in the early years, I sound like such an old person, in the early years of blogging, um, there wasn't a lot of that like there is today. You know, today you see a lot of Instagrammers and TikTokers um, collaborating together and doing a lot together. And so that's still very much an adjustment for me. Um, so that, I guess, is one way that I protect, like, who, I'm just very specific about who I'm going to actually work with. I mean, there are times when we're like, we're all at an event together um, and things like that. And that that's, but I don't really consider those collaborations. Those were just things that we were all invited to do together. We didn't really um, select who was going to be there, the, the, the brand did. And so... That's that. And then in terms of like protecting what other people do with my content, you know, today in the world of the internet, that's almost impossible. If somebody wants to, uh, what do they call it? If somebody wants to take your, your content and do something else with it, this kind of the risk that you take in putting uh, online content out there. You can do your, I mean, I, I have seen in group chats in, in Facebook groups where a bloggers had their entire blog post just scraped and reposted as someone else, so not giving them any credit at all. The same thing with videos. Something that really happens a lot is uh, someone else, and it's usually like this, this, you know, kind of body scammer type of website, and they'll just take these um, videos, they'll scrape them off, and then they'll crop them where they'll crop out your logo or anything that identifies you and just use it as theirs. And that really sucks because these people, I know it takes a long time to create videos, to create content. And that's really, really unfortunate. 
And so you can try to spend the time to go after them. Um, and I've seen some people do that successfully, but most nothing happens. It's just, there's no regulations around that that are solid enough that a smaller influencer can actually win that fight. Okay. And yeah, I mean, I guess it's like, it's everyone's playground. So people right. can do yeah. whatever. It's the, it's the pros and the cons of the wild, wild west of, of being an influencer, right? Like there's the, the, the pros are that we can create whatever we want. We can come up with campaigns however we want to. There's no guidelines or rules. Like we can, we can, the possibilities are endless. The cons are that anybody can take your stuff and do whatever they want with it. Yes. And then I guess, do you miss the old days? Like maybe when you were starting <laughs> out that there was not a lot of people in there in this space, not that there's more competition, but you mentioned like now everyone can become a blogger. Like even if you have whatever followers, or even if you don't have followers, like people talk and express themselves as if they had a big audience and there's like yeah. less connotation or fear to do so. Right. Like you, right. Yeah. So, you, I mean, I know you, you said that you think that's great, but at the same time, do you feel maybe sometimes there should be some betting of like <laughs> who goes there or like what's like what's your perspective on that? I mean, yeah, like there are some things in your well, here's the biggest challenge is that before COVID-19, right? Because today I'm like, you do what you got to do. OK, but it the one of the biggest challenges was that those of us who have made this our career, our brand, um, who are investing our own time and resources and money into this, there is a business side of influencer marketing, right? And so, and that's where we're trying to be and be professional and build relationships and make it mutually beneficial for people who are paying us and our audience, right? And so then here comes along somebody who's like, I'm going to be an influencer or a blogger or whatever. And then they will just do everything for free. It really devalues what a lot of other people are trying to do. And so that's hard. But at, on, on the other side, I also understand because I did a lot of things for free when I was starting out just to get my foot in the door to start those relationships. So it's a little, I mean, that's just the honest, honest, honest truth. It's like, it, it's hard. It's hard uh, because you want people to start and you want them to succeed. So you understand why they'd be doing it. But then on the other side, there's a business model. And if there's no like influencer, I mean, there is an influencer association, but it's not where we all are banded together and saying, you know, we're not going to do X, Y, and Z for free anymore. We're going to start charging um, X amount of rates so that everyone can have a piece of the pie. So that is a little bit frustrating. Um, and do I miss the old days? The only thing that I miss about the old days is that it was just writing. <laughs> <laughs> there was less things to worry about. <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean, I, I mean, I will say, I will, I'll uh, be very transparent in that there has been a lot of self growth for me in all of this. Yes, in there have been times when I'm like uh, super frustrated and mad because I feel like there's a lot of competition. And that was a lot for me personally to grow through that. I had to start, I had to learn that what I bring to the table, what my value is, is being me. And that no one else was going to get the job that was meant for me. And that's a lot to learn. So for the people who come in with already that, part of themselves grounded they're the ones that are going to have the most success there's just that human nature of competitiveness and comparison that if you let it get to you will bring you down or hold you back at least no and I mean I think even though there's kind of a space for everyone or everyone like freedom of speech everyone can go out there and say whatever they want or like get followers 
there's no restrictions on that. But at the same time, it's like not everyone will make it right. um, out there because maybe they're like, ah, oh, well, this is not like they don't have the grit or the oh, persistence yeah. of being like, hey, I'm going to really like put content out there every day. I'm going to yeah. create valuable content. I'm going to listen to my audience and make sure that whatever I'm posting is relevant. It's not like, oh, well, today I'm just going to post a recipe right. because I don't have anything else or whatever. Like for you sure. have to stick to your content. Yeah, if you have no strategy. So I guess for, I mean, we're, we're kind of uh, almost hitting the time. So for kind of like, what would you give insight or advice for somebody that's starting out? Um, I don't know if there's a school out there for people who are trying to influence or trying to become a social media um, kind of personality. Sure. But what would you say like, hey, this is something like if I would have known this or even, I mean, you started very different, differently. So mm -hmm. I think it might be easier for people starting right now, but at the same time, there's more people out there. So what would you say is like, hey, right now, this is like really what you need to understand in the sense, in, in the sense of like schooling, like this is what you need to learn before you actually like yeah. um, think about going big or what would you recommend? So I would, for one, say decide very early on if this is going to be a hobby or a business, because that will help guide you in what you do. Or even if it's like you're just dabbling in it, you're not sure if it's going to be like a business. If you have an ounce of, I would like to make money doing this, start it with the intentions of it being a business. Because it's very hard to go from hobby to business rather than, okay, I started as a business. This isn't really working out. Now it's just my hobby. That's way easier. It's harder to start it as a hobby with no clear direction or strategy and then try to change it into a business. It's also harder to get people to pay you after you've been doing it for free. That is the biggest lesson that I learned. Um, if you do too much for free, people won't see the value in paying you to do it later on. So that's the first thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is really understand what value you're trying to bring to the audience. People are inundated with all kinds of content on every social media platform, inside their emails, um, online, like everywhere. And so why are they going to pay attention to you why do they want to follow you? Um, what value are you bringing them? That's, and because look, there's nothing that any new influencer is going to do today that hasn't been done already. It's just, it's just logic. Like there's, everyone has already done it. The only thing that makes it different is the way that you are doing it and the perspective that you bring. So decide early if you want it to be a hobby or business figure out what, what value you're bringing to your audience and know that only you can bring, only you can bring what you bring. And then in terms of like education, there are a lot of things online, <laughs> like schools and things like that, that'll tell you um, how to get started. And they range from free to $2,000 for a course. So in that aspect, I would say, do what works for you. Maybe if you need to start out with the free resources to get started, do that. And then later on, if you can invest in the education, then you can invest. I was self-taught. And so I definitely had more time than money when I was getting started. And I still use that uh, philosophy today. Like I have still, I'm, teaching myself constantly about SEO and um, coding my website and Google Analytics and all kinds of things. So uh, you, you pick the education that's best for you. Yeah, and I think that's great insight for any entrepreneur, any, anyone who's starting something, because if you don't realize from the beginning if it's going to be a hobby or is it going to be a business, like you have to realize how are you going to make money if, yeah. if this has anything of value? Like that happens a lot with food entrepreneurs. They're like, well, I'm really good at making cookies, but it takes me two hours to make one. 
like, hey, well, I don't think um, you have a business there. It might be a yeah. hobby, like you can do it for your friends or figure right. out a way to right. maximize your time and effort in the kitchen so you can make money. So Absolutely. I think it's like looking at that for for any adventure or venture that you're that people are trying to launch. Like figure out if this is going to be something that you can support your family or you can, or if, if you have the time and want to do it for, as a hobby, like that's that's great too. Like just yeah. I mean, I would say with things like, if you can find your value, right? If you find your value, I say (laughs) go for it in the business sense because there's so many resources today, like Launch SA, Lift Fund, the Small Businesses, uh, uh, the Development Center. Yeah, there's so, (laughs) in the Development Center, there's so many resources that are available today for small businesses to make it that there's really no reason to not at least try do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. especially like an online business, like just if there's little overhead for you to get started, just go for it. I yeah. Mean, you'll learn, you'll definitely learn along the way. And maybe it's not this, that's your business. Maybe it's something else. That's what happened to me. I was in direct sales. I thought that was going to be my business. And it turned out the best thing that direct sales taught me was that I wanted to work for myself. And that's why I'm where I am today. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate so much the time you put out, um, the hour that you've given us some insight on how you got started. I think stories that resemble like kind of, I mean, it took you five years to maybe figure it out. Like you, yeah. you didn't stop for five years trying to figure it out. Right. So, right. Uh, right. showing other entrepreneurs and small business owners that it's possible that you have to pivot, that you have to learn and relearn ways to doing things. Um, it's important for you to succeed. It's not going to be just like one day you decide to be something and it's going to happen. It's take some work and it's right. worth it. Right. I think you're still growing Absolutely. and we yeah. haven't seen like maybe half of the stuff that you, you, you're actually able to do and create for, for San Antonio community. So, and I appreciate like all that you're doing, like, thank you. Cause I think it supports um, just the brand, uh, the community, like having someone to relate to, um, being a Latina, like it is like you want to see somebody in the other side that looks like you, that has the same struggles, that has the same family or anything like that right. resembles the actual um, you as a person. Right. So thank you for that. Uh, thank thank you. you so much. And we'll be posting this later. So I appreciate you. I think this and I'll share it with you as well. So thank you so much. Th- and thanks thank for you. You, what you guys do. Like, I think it's very, I think, especially, especially right now, uh, the entrepreneur community needs these resources. I'm happy to h- sit and offer, tell my story, support however I can. Um, I will continue now. So the other thing about where we're at today is now I'm getting to do all the things that I said I would do one day. <laughs> If yeah. I only had the time. So you'll be seeing um, things like what you mentioned, like how to get started blogging, um, how to use social media coming from me um, to try to help people continue and pivot. Yeah, that's, that's, that's important for any business. So I appreciate it. And just enjoy your week. We're just starting the week. So enjoy it. Um, you too. And we hope to see you more, more and more. Absolutely. Have a great day. Thank you so much. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.